In 2005, NASA launched the Space Shuttle Discovery on STS-114, the first mission since the loss of Columbia and her crew. For safety, NASA instituted new procedures to inspect the Space Shuttle in orbit. One of the new procedures was a pitch maneuver prior to docking with the International Space Station. This allowed astronauts on board the station to take photos of Discovery's heat shield so that engineers on the ground could inspect it for damage. It was one of these high-resolution photos that turned up a couple of small details with the potential to become a big problem. Engineers found that two gap fillers were sticking out near the front of the space shuttle. Gap fillers are small, ceramic-reinforced bits of fabric that are tucked between the heat shield tiles. Although the gap fillers were only sticking out about 25 millimeters, or the diameter of a U.S. quarter, even roughness that small might be a problem during re-entry. Exactly why that's the case is a question of boundary layer stability and the transition from laminar to turbulent flow. Joining me today to help explain is Diana Cowan of Physics Girl. Hey, Diana. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me. So stability is a concept that shows up a lot in physics. How do you usually think of it? I usually think of stability as um, whether something's in equilibrium. So for example, a ball that's sitting on the top of a hill is in an unstable equilibrium, meaning that if you give it a little nudge, it'll just roll off the hill. If it's in a bowl or a valley, it's in a stable equilibrium. So if you give it a little nudge, it'll roll up a little bit, but it'll come right back down to its position. So that's an everyday example of stability in physics, but what does stability look like for you? How does it relate to fluid dynamics and the space shuttle? That's a really great question. So in aerodynamics, a lot of the time we don't talk about what's stable or unstable. We talk about whether flow is laminar or turbulent. The laminar flow is smooth and orderly. It's like when you first turn on a water faucet and it's all nice and clear. Turbulent flow is like what you get when you turn the water faucet on all the way and it gets crazy and disordered and kind of random. Flow near an object right at the surface is an area that we call the boundary layer and that boundary layer can be either laminar or turbulent. Typically a boundary layer will start out laminar and if it's disturbed it'll become turbulent. Disturbances that enter the boundary layer start out so tiny that they're impossible to see or measure but if the boundary layer is unstable to those disturbances, then they'll grow as they move downstream, eventually becoming large enough to alter the flow. When the disturbances get big enough, they cause the boundary layer to become turbulent. So if a boundary layer is stable to a disturbance, then it's kind of like the ball sitting in the valley where if it's disturbed, it'll roll back down and the flow will stay laminar. Whereas uh, if it's unstable to a disturbance, then it's more like the ball sitting on the top of the hill and it'll roll down when disturbed and the flow will become turbulent. Yep. Okay, I got it. So is it a problem when a flow becomes turbulent? It depends on the situation. So generally speaking, a laminar boundary layer has less friction based drag than a turbulent one does. So a flow that's laminar over a surface, for example, an airplane wing has less friction based drag so an airplane can go further on the same amount of fuel. Exactly. Sometimes though, turbulence is helpful. Like when you're pouring milk in your coffee, if there weren't turbulence, you would have to wait several days for the milk to distribute through the coffee. So the turbulent flow is useful in some situations, but typically not in air travel. Yes, and that brings us back to the space shuttle. I think I see where you're going here. So the gap fillers that were sticking out could potentially cause turbulent flow. Yeah. Boundary layers can be unstable to all kinds of disturbances, including surface roughness. Relative to the size of the space shuttle, the roughness from the gap fillers was not very large. If we scaled it to the size of this LEGO space shuttle, that roughness would be roughly the size of the width of a human hair. The physics of how roughness affects boundary layers, especially at the really high speeds that the space shuttle sees during re-entry, is complicated and it's not very well understood. I see. So even with simulations, the engineers on the ground were worried that these itty bitty gap fillers might potentially cause a serious problem on re-entry. Exactly. So the problem is that the gap fillers were located up here near the nose and the landing gear. So that means that if transition did happen, you would have turbulent flow over most of the underside of the space shuttle. The space shuttle was built to withstand the highest temperatures on the nose and along the leading edges of its wing. They used special material there, reinforced carbon carbon that was good to above 2000 degrees Celsius. The rest of the space shuttle was covered in heat tiles that were only good to about 1200 degrees Celsius. A turbulent boundary layer on the underside of the vehicle means that it would see substantially higher temperatures than normal. That same turbulence that's so great at mixing your coffee is going to be pulling plasma that's more than 3000 degrees Celsius closer to the underside of the space shuttle. That is incredibly hot. 
yeah, it's a pretty serious problem. What did NASA do? What did they do about the gap fillers? So NASA did a spacewalk to the underside of the space shuttle, which was something they'd never done before. They sent astronaut Steve Robinson down to the bottom of the space shuttle and had him pull out the gap fillers by hand. Whoa. The shuttle landed safely and NASA launched new research programs into the effects of surface roughness on boundary layer transition. That's actually part of what funded my PhD research. So thanks for watching and special thanks to Diana for joining me today. Thanks for having me. If you'd like to see a more down-to-earth application for roughness and boundary layer transition, you should check out Diana's latest video. You'll learn about the reverse Magnus effect and how surface roughness affects how a soccer ball curves inflate. It's pretty awesome. You should check it out. So thanks again for watching and special thanks to my Patreon patrons who help make FYFD possible. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe here on YouTube and check out the main website over on Tumblr. If you want to help support FYFD and get access to cool rewards, check out patreon.com FYFD. In the meantime, you've made it to the end of the credits, so maybe you should go watch Diana's video.